Alec Baldwin is facing the most challenging role of his life. He's facing 18 months in prison, accused of involuntary manslaughter for shooting a member of the production staff on the set of the movie Rust. Does the prosecution have a valid case or is he on trial because he is a world famous celebrity? Plus diddy details that are gonna make your head spin today. Welcome everybody, I'm Tom Zenner of Tom Zenner Scandal. This is the one and only Cato Kalen. Oh my, we're pounding it. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> welcome to One Degree of Scandalous and welcome to our guest, a very familiar face. Do I get a bump? You do. <laughs> oh wait, I got, a, I got one too. Sarah Zari, uh, News Nation, on pretty much every legal case there is, you're gonna see her face on TV, a very famous trial attorney here in Los Angeles and an authority on celebrity cases and all things judicial. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, thanks Tom, thanks oh, Cato. Thank you. You know, I say we get right into it with uh, with Alec Baldwin. This mm -hmm. is the one we've been waiting for for a while and this thing happened quickly. He had the, the charges dropped, now they're back. Um, maybe one of the biggest questions is who's gonna handle the daycare bill while he's, <laughs> while he's on trial with all those kids. Kids. But Sarah, you've been uh, very outspoken on this. You have a, a strong opinion. Mm -hmm. Should we be seeing Alec Baldwin in a courtroom in Santa Fe, New Mexico right now, or is this BS? I think, look, uh, a civil courtroom, of course, and there's tons of civil lawsuits surrounding this incident, but a criminal courtroom I have a problem with. Um, obviously, the uh, Santa Fe is making this into a criminally negligent act. Um, and that's why it's involuntary manslaughter charge. But but really, I mean, it was just a freak accident, you know, and it's unfortunate and it's tragic. Um, I think part of it has to do with the fact that even though there's an armor who's convicted and the other, I think it was the assistant director who also pled and is convicted, nobody has the name and the fame that Baldwin does. So he's the one that they get to use to send a louder message. Hey, you don't get to come to our town and shoot a film and then kill somebody. You got to right. be, you know, practice safety and et cetera. So a lot of it has to do with the fact that, that he's a celebrity, but also he was the trigger man, mm -hmm. you know, he was the trigger man. And so when two other people whose duty was to ensure the safety of the set are also convicted, you can't just leave the guy that whether he pulled the trigger or fanned the back or whatever, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a distinction without a difference. Yeah. Um, the, the the gun fired. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think it was a producer on the film too, if I'm not mistaken. I yeah, think he was a producer. It, it did, but here's the thing, it's going back, he's coming back, it's going on right now, the jury selection. But I wanna ask you, didn't he have time when they call us, phone messages, the phone messages, he had time, he probably erased them? that Alec Baldwin had messages, maybe after a, an event like something tragic, you're pretty much around the phone talking to someone or yeah. texting someone. Did the prosecution not know that to get the phone right away? There was an issue with the phone. I remember that it took a long time to process the phone, which I was like, what is yeah. the sheriff's department doing? Why are they taking, it doesn't take right. that long. It takes an hour to download mm -hmm. the phone. Um, but, but there was also reports that he had deleted that certain things, which to me, Obviously, we don't know what he deleted. Um, there is, I believe there is a claim that's going to come in that he didn't respond quickly enough that perhaps her life could have been saved uh, had he made the 911 call earlier, et cetera. That, that's part of what I'm seeing the right. prosecution's case, a, a, a small part, but an important yeah. part. The bigger part, Cato um, and Tom, is that he pulled the trigger or whatever he did. Um, there's a gun expert who's going to come in and say this gun was in perfectly working order and that the only way it would have fired is if you pull the trigger. Then there's a star witness who's going to say that he saw Alec pull the trigger. And so there, you know, there's this there's this dichotomy or duality of standards of safety. The defense is saying there's this Hollywood standard. The Hollywood standard is an actor should not check a gun. An actor should just rely on the safety of a gun or any prop given to him by others who have that duty. Um, the prosecution saying, no, universal gun safety rule 101. Anytime you pick up a gun, you have to assume it's unsafe unless you personally check yep, it. Right. Yep. So ultimately, it's about who you get picked on this jury because... You know, if I was the prosecution, I'd want really, really anal retentive people, like people that are really strict in <laughs> yeah, life yeah. who don't do a, you know, do everything by the book yeah. and take safety very yep. seriously. The defense, of course, wants like the people that the, the F the government kind of people who are like 
pro chaos. Yeah. You know, and um, we'll see what happens, right? Yeah. You know, Sarah, one thing about Alec Baldwin, he is a polarizing figure in Hollywood and around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people don't like him. Mm -hmm. He gets a lot of attention. He's dramatic. He's always in the news. There's something about his personality that can be grating to people. Does that play a role in whether a prosecution even decides to press charges? I mean, this is going to bring so much headlines to these prosecutors to Santa Fe. And and, and his interview with George Stephanopoulos, Mm -hmm. when he said he didn't pull the trigger Mm -hmm. and he was adamant about it, could that eventually backfire on him? Backfire? (laughs) Part of the uh, gun pun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Look, it it depends on whether he takes the stand. Obviously, look, um, almost everyone knows who he is. So it's hard to get a jury that doesn't know Alec Baldwin. But um, and even though they're supposed to set aside everything they know about him and just, you know, focus on the evidence, it's hard when you come in as a human being with preconceived ideas and notions to set everything aside. But if he takes the stand, I mean, I I don't think it's a good idea to take a stand because he is not only said that to to George Stephanopoulos. He also went on Chris Cuomo's podcast and doubled down on that and said he didn't pull the trigger. He didn't buy it. Just like demonstrated what he did. So what's he going to do after the prosecution puts on an eyewitness and a gun expert who both say that this could have only, well, first of all, he did pull the trigger and this could have only happened if he pulled the trigger. So it's almost pointless for him to take the stand. But, but look, actors, Akato knows this, have jury appeal. Actors know how to handle themselves on the stand. They He can get very emotional. This was a very uh, traumatic experience in his lifetime. He was very distraught by it. I think no one's going to look at his posts sure. and, and behavior and be like, oh, he's faking it. He was really distraught. Right. And the prosecution is worried about him conveying that to this jury. Yeah. You know, I, I got a two-part because uh, Sarah brought something up that made me think of another thought. First of all, isn't it on film? in the shoots that he's shooting. Yes. It's, it, it's That's so, also on video. It's on video. So that, to show that, that shows that he's pointing at her, which is another safety issue the, that he violated. It, hey, I'm really excited about our sponsor for this show today, Nextiva, because I know the demos of our audience, and this is something that is really going to change your life. Because if you're using your phone to close business deals, not only are you mixing work and play, but you are sabotaging your chances of success in business. Now I can relate. I, like many of you, have a business. I have a media company. We do documentaries, TV shows, books, podcasts. I get calls and have to communicate with a lot of people that are decision makers and make decisions on the spot. I can't tell you how many times by just using my personal phone that's gotten delayed or I've lost deals because of it. Now, not only Does it look amateur? But you and your team are probably using 18 different apps to get your work done, right? Let our sponsor of this video, Nextiva, cut this down to just one app, just one. Nextiva consolidates your business voice, texts, video meetings, and CRM inside of one app. You get seamless, personalized customer interactions across all channels, and you can do this even if you are currently running your business off your personal phone and your CRM is a spreadsheet. You don't need any tech experience either. You just need to download their app and follow the easy setup. You can make this one change and your business will look as polished as a Fortune 500 company. It's worked for me. And now you'll be able to focus on closing and scaling your business. Hey, this is the year to level up your business and lower your costs. So go to trynextiva.com slash Tom Zenner. That's trynextiva.com slash Tom Zenner. Or use the link down below in the description to get 50% off your plan. 50%. The link is in the description of the episode as well. Do a lot of uh, criminal white color crime and you know how to handle people. Don't you think He's got a short fuse. If you're really a good lawyer, you want to get, if he gets on the stand or whatever, but the th- point would be for you to get him upset. You know how to push his buttons to show the jury. He's an angry man. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's like you can make this guy, I've seen him, I've met him. He's, right. uh, he could be he a He goes very, from zero to 200 in no time. <laughs> yes. Right. So, and the, the other part I was going to make is, uh, I worked on a few films with, uh, you know, guns. Every actor that I think actors have already said they always check the gun, even though that's a job. They always check the gun to make sure they want to show the person it's empty, uh, right. it's or it's not a real gun or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's no pin. Mm-hmm. Everybody, 
I think he even said that, if I'm not mistaken, he, he that he always checks a gun. Not 100% not this positive. Time. Well, yeah, I, that's right. what I was saying is so. But the point is that everybody checks the gun, even mm-hmm. though it's not their yeah, job. But then we have a dead body that says he didn't. You know what I mean? Right. No, so exactly. that, that immediately exactly. just wipes that away. It yeah. doesn't that. matter what he's done historically. It matters what he did here. Mm-hmm. And he, he didn't check the gun. I mean, that's yeah. just a just not disputed. You know, you said it's not a good idea for Alec Baldwin to take the stand. But let's face facts here. This guy's brilliant. He's a smart guy. Yeah. Um, and he loves the camera. And he mm-hmm. probably thinks he's smarter than other people because maybe he is. I mean, look at some of his best roles. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross with that monologue, right? And right. the other one where he played the doctor and said, I am God. Can't you see a scenario here where he's got a script written already? I'm going to bamboozle this jury in small town Santa Fe. They won't be able to handle me. I will get on that stand and win the case right here. My mm-hmm. opinion is he's going to demand to testify. And I think his I, his uh, personality stronger than his attorney. Well, it's certainly his right. Um, so as lawyers, we advise the client. And the, by the way, that is a very fluid decision. I've had cases where I thought my client has to testify because he has to humanize himself or he has to explain a fact I can't otherwise get in. And by the time it comes time, the prosecution rests, I'm like, nah, he's not going to testify. Or I might go, I have him ready just in case. And I go, you know what? You have to testify. It's a very fluid decision, but ultimately I can only advise the client whether they should or shouldn't do it. It's ultimately his right to waive or to take the stand. And so I will see. I I, mean, the TV ratings would go up if he, he and this thing's being televised. No way though. I think you're wrong. I think there's no way he testifies because it's too much of a chance that just one juror, two jurors just don't like him. Yeah, but this is how it's And if a good lawyer, if a good lawyer is going to push his button like a Sarah, you can push this guy's button he, zero to two hundred. Okay, well, don't you go, think? No, don't you I totally think he disagree. thinks he's smarter than that other lawyer? He, this is a this I, is I a, do, a but I think, I think that would get him in trouble. Especially because the judge just ruled that the prosecution cannot get in um, evidence that he was, was an angry and yelling uh, at people on right. set. Like that's not going to come in. So the last thing you want to do is risk him showing his. Uh, short fuse. And I, I show him going on the stand. I think people. He. I think people would look at him on the stand, going, "He's playing a character. I don't like this. He's not right. playing Alec Baldwin. He's playing. He's an actor. He does this. Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, Miami Blues. He's a, a criminal. I in think that. you could yeah. say this about any other actor, but I think for him, he's going to want to do this. This is. I think this is the outlier, the one guy well, you, that would think that he could get himself out of this right. by himself. You. Right. You're, you're also a, depends. You know. Look. There are going to be jurors, and I don't know ultimately who's going to sit on this jury, but there are jurors who are going to be, oh, how cool that Hollywood's coming into town and bringing us revenue, (laughs) right? And they're starstruck, right? Whether they know Alex movies or not. Um, But on the other hand, I think there's going to be jurors, no matter what, who understand that this was an accident. Even though it was an accident, they still have a job to do to determine whether it was criminally negligent. But they know it was an accident. And and the idea is, does he want to risk, you know, letting him, his lawyer argue that versus him maybe taking the risk I'd of- I'd say he wants to. i say he wants to. But I'll tell you what, Tom, I, I think something else that we're forgetting is New Mexico. Once Hollywood to come there, it could work against them on the tax breaks, how much revenue sure. brings in. And if they convict him, no one's going to want to work there again. Right. So this could become very political. Like, you know what? We're making this much money every year of the productions coming here. Now they're not going to come because there's exactly, a, they're, so, they're afraid of getting prosecuted. And that could be part of the attorney's working Strategy. it that way. Exactly. But, but Alec Baldwin isn't going to give a crap about that. It's his life at I, stake, right. right? He's not going to worry about tax breaks. Well, it's, no, 18, somebody, not, but it's Mex- 18 months at stake. Yeah. New Mexico, <laughs> the New Mexico <laughs> judge. Okay. The, I, I get a little dramatic. It's, a, it's an election year for the judge too. And the judge wants yeah. revenue coming yeah. into their state. Right. So that could play a big part. Yeah. You know, one thing you can't argue with, though, is it's a tough case to prove because they have right. to prove that he was negligent, that he may have known that there was a bullet in that there, he a acted live bullet. with re- reckless disregard <laughs> yeah. of human yeah. life. Mm, that's tough. So you know, him getting on the stand could maybe almost only hurt him, right? Because there might be just enough evidence for reasonable doubt or whatever is needed in this case. Right. But, you know, the bottom line is. But think is, about this. The judge said you cannot go into his emotional response to all of this. Okay. So that, that if he takes the stand, he cannot start talking about how it's impacted him and all that stuff. So then you're left with yeah. the actual facts. Okay. 
What can he say that's not already in evidence that his lawyer can argue? I mean, there's nothing. Okay. So to, that's one of the reasons why we have a client yeah. testifies. If there's a fact that only they can testify to, there's really nothing there that's only within his knowledge that he needs to testify one to. Thing. Taking out the emotional stuff. Hold on. But the, but the other thing is um, the um, humanizing. You know, does he, Alec Baldwin, need to, need to humanize himself to this jury? They've seen everything. They saw how distraught he was. They they know this is an accident. They know he didn't do it on purpose. So the two real purposes of putting someone on the stand, to me, are not not worth the risk of putting them right. on the Can't stand. Can't you be distraught because you know you screwed up? Right? I mean, that could be... And, and the other yeah, thing, too, but he, he, was, doing, he was sobbing profusely. Yeah, he, he, that was... He, it was not... He did not do this. No, I agree. Who would have devastated? No way. So that's more yeah. the case. And they were, they were friends. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they'd yeah. become friends. Yeah, but he was reckless. But he wasn't supposed to bring... The, they're going to bring in testimony that, you know, the director said that he was only supposed to unholster it. He wasn't supposed to bring it up. And how does a yeah, trajectory of a bullet go right... To, he pointed at her. I mean, how? That's 101 in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Don't point a gun whether right. it's loaded or not. That's and what people are missing. Bullet? That's what people are missing. People are focused on pulling the trigger. That's, you know, there are two ways that he failed his duty or he acted in disregard of human life, reckless disregard. One is by failing to check the, the gun mm -hmm. for live ammunition. The second one is by pointing the gun, even if he thought it was right. empty. Okay, you unloaded. Point the guns to the side. You're not you supposed point to point. Directly. You're not supposed to point directly. And you know his uh, what he's always said in interviews, and what the the, the lawyers are going to make in defense is that a case out of the million dollar question: Who brought the live ammo? It doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter who brought the live ammo. You still got. That's why you got to check. Yeah. What What happened? You know, just bringing back. I, I'm sure the lawyers look back at other cases in that there was a film called The Crow. Mm, Brandon Lee yes. got killed. Uh, and that was also a live round that went right through him yes. and they finished the filming with another act, you know, just with yeah. silhouettes. And um, I have a huge connection that I'll tell you um, later or I can tell you now. But anyways, a dear friend of mine was Shelley Le Webster in the film. Sophia Chanesse became friends. She was the fiance in the film. Mm. And they everybody how distraught they were because Brandon Lee from that film was going to be this superstar. I mean, from he'll be like an A-list actor for the rest of his life because of that film. So his life ended tragically. Yeah. So I wonder if they go back on that and find out. I don't know what, what the case. I don't you know what, what happened Kato? in that case. Uh, I was the first person who interviewed uh, the prosecution's gun expert, Steve Wolf. I don't know if he's testifying or not, but he was the guy that they shopped around that they found who would support the position that no matter who you are on whatever set, you're supposed to check the gun, even an right. actor. So Steve I interviewed Wolf Steve on, Wolf on the Steve Wolf he, on this case, on Baldwin on Baldwin. Got it. And, and I interviewed him. This was back December of right after it happened, yeah. December, whatever it was 21. 21. And he, and he said, um, he told me about the standard, et cetera. And then he said that the only other, cause I kept saying, well, why allow real guns on Hollywood sets. Why, you know, he, he said, you know, live ammo can make, make its way on sets. Uh, we don't want to use prop guns or whatever. We use real guns. And I said, but the risk is too high. And he brought up that movie right. and he said, but, but the ratio of loss to benefit is really low. I'm like, losing oh one God. life, what, right. losing one life <laughs> is bad enough. Well, you know? also, also a live round, a, li a bullet, there's also, Blank second kill, which Correct. Eric Hackney, Blank's actor Eric Hexum. Right, right. And that is another thing. Yeah. A, and a that's another reason blank. why you don't point. So, you don't, exactly. Sure. Right. And then they only allowed rubber bullets on the set when they resume shooting. Right. But, you know, the, two things. Number one, they're not going to allow the fact that he was an EP on the film enter, right. it, you know, into which the case. Which is a big win for it's the defense. It's a huge win because he had a hand in hiring the armorer. Correct. And, and to me, there is- And the unsafe conditions and also. There, there is negligence if somehow a live round ends up on a movie set. Yeah. It is just so un inexcusable. Right. right. And it's unbelievable. By the way, the civil trials, I'm sure, are going to mount after this. Mm -hmm. But um, Gutierrez, the armorer, mm -hmm. is in prison. But last thing I'm going to say about him being on the stand, which I think we'll see him. Okay, I think we'll see Tom him. really wants we're, him to test him. We're going to have a side but bet. But what Tom. about, why can't the pre <laughs> prosecution no say, Alec Baldwin, you get on the stand right now and explain to us how you didn't pull the trigger and it went off. They can't do that. They yeah. cannot allude in any way to a defendant's right to um, take the fifth. 
That's his constitutional right. They cannot infer they cannot infer anything or encourage the jury to infer that he's guilty because he's not taking the stand or that he should take the stand. They cannot interfere with that right at all. So they can't they got to shut up when it comes to that constitutional right. But, you know, again, I, I don't see the I don't see the benefit of him testifying, mm-hmm. but I know you want him to testify. So <laughs> yeah. we'll see. You know, I love I Sarah. Just, she just loves the constitutional rights. And I am with you 100 percent. Yeah, Follow it's the right. Constitution. It is his right. But you know, it's yeah. our right to have good television. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's our right he's, to be entertained. Yeah. We, have, we have the side bet. He's not testifying. OK, well, uh, we'll see what happens uh, here. Um, you know, it's, it's going to I just think he is the one of one. Yeah. I think he's that one actor. He is smart. He yeah. is brilliant. He has a huge ego. I think all of that could potentially play a role in this. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just curious for this as an attorney, as a big time attorney here in LA. How are you aggressive in pursuing cases like this? Do they come to you? Do you, would you, would you want to take on a big one like this? Do they attract you? You know, yes, but you know, um, people like Baldwin, like think about who he's hired. He's hired a big firm, you know, I think it's Quinn Emanuel or something. And it's interesting to me because the big firms typically don't do these sort of street crime type of offenses. They do white collar, which I do as well. Um, but you know, they tend to gravitate towards these sort of national bigger firms that are like, you know, $2,000 an hour. I mean, I'm not cheap, but, um, but that's sort of where they end up. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, towards the beginning of my career, I was on the Robert Blake, uh, defense team. And so that was a very interesting case. And, Mm. you know, he was acquitted. Um, and, uh, so, you know, from time to time, I get a lot of, uh, me two cases involving athletes and celebrities. That seems to be my niche okay. right now. Uh, women who come forward and make all kinds of, you know, buyer's remorse type okay. allegations. <laughs> so they come to me to kind of put out those fires, but that's sort of my celebrity practice. Mm. So, so in your, I, I, you represent the athlete? Or the, or the celebrity or the the actor or, or the athlete. You're a, correct. The woman trying to come back for my Yeah, the woman. You're the opposite the, of Gloria Allred. I am the opposite of Gloria Allred. <laughs> okay. Cha-ching. And I go against the firm every so often on the parallel uh, hey, That stuff. happens a lot. You know, where guys oh, get a lot. wrongly yeah. accused. It happened to a recent NBA. I mean, we've pick. always had yeah. money grabs, but now yeah. with the Me Too, it's just a, it's a regular thing. Yep. Yeah. Sarah Azari. How's your podcast going? You enjoy doing it? We are, you know, we, it's different than yours. Uh, we just kind of do it when we can't, you mm-hmm. know, it's at well, mm-hmm. but it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's gotta be doing good. I got one of your coffee mugs. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> she, by the way, she worked at the podcast is with Jim Griffin, who, uh, Jim, uh, if I'm yeah. correct saying that he was the defense attorney for, for Murdoch, Alec Murdoch, Alec yeah. Murdoch. In that case, that was like the number one right. documentary on Netflix forever. I mean, it's amazing that, uh, and by the way, Tom, I don't know if you know, Sarah and I did a show with Dr. Phil yep. all about true crime, which is pretty much our show that 76% of people in America are addicted to it. Yeah, and having you on, I got to tell you, just talking to you here, I, I talked to you and Dr. Phil, uh, obviously you're, you're super educated, med cum laude, and uh, you went to- uh, I think Southwestern. The, the Southwestern, mm-hmm. um, which one of my attorneys went to in the Simpson trial. Uh, your career, you speak five languages. Yeah. So have you ever have you ever done a case in another language? Where you well, had go- I, you know, at the beginning of my career, I lived in Brazil. So um, I picked that up very quickly. I, I, I just have a thing for languages. Depends. I mean, I probably can't speak Chinese or anything. I haven't tried. But... Uh, Western languages. Four others. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Western languages. I know someone that can speak and Chinese. And that's my wife. Yeah, okay. Kevin yeah, right. speaks Wisconsin, and I speak uh, Minnesota. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Oh, oh, hey, Tom, hi. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, almost four years yeah. in Brazil kind of got me yes, that's in what's... handling cases in Portuguese. You know, I'm addicted to court t- court trials, like yeah. fiction. Yeah. Fiction, I just love it. Uh, yeah. Presumed Innocent right now right. on Apple is so good. Columbo is my favorite show. Mine people, too. One people of don't oh, believe it when I say Innocent that. Presumed Innocent with Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Is it good? It's great. And you can um, binge on it and get caught up. And there's, I think, two episodes left to go. But you mentioned Robert Blake. Yeah. Okay, a very famous celebrity trial. Cato could go on for days about yeah. his stories about Robert yeah, Blake. Robert, yeah. Robert Blake was a huge fan of yours, essentially, wasn't he? Well, I met him. He used to go to the Playboy Mansion. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was. it was a guy you kind of, I didn't. Uh, I didn't oh, really hang out or say, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. hang out. I, he would always say hi, be cordial. Yeah. I actually knew his son better because mm-hmm. we worked out at the same gym for a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know it was Robert Blake's son mm-hmm. until uh, I saw him at the club, uh, yeah. at the health club. And someone said that's that Robert was Blake's wild. Son. And, you know, yeah. he, he rented uh, Tom Mesero, who was on the case before us, uh, got him off, did a phenomenal job at the prelim, uh, something that rarely happens. He got off on, on 
um, I don't know how much bond, a million, million something. And he was on an ankle bracelet and he had to be very close to the courthouse. So he rented this dump of a house in Panorama City, which was a dump area, if you don't know LA. And uh, <laughs> and he, he set up a law office for us in the back house. And it was hilarious because he would be there micromanaging everything from the color of the tabs that are going to buy trial books. And, you know, I mean, it, it, I have to tell you, it was it was crazy to live through it. But in hindsight, it was comical. Mm -hmm. You know, I take my dogs there. It was like one big family, you know, and he uh, you know, he would come up to me and say, hey, Tootsie, he'd call me Tootsie. Uh, you remember so-and-so? And I'm like, what show? Oh, but, and I'm like, I look up the show. It's like from 1969. I'm like, yo, I was born in 71. <laughs> like, hello. So, yeah, so you're, you're you, Robert Blake is there. You're there oh, at the he same time. Like, who's oh, calling you Tootsie, Blake? Or, Blake. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, well, well, good was, thing it, I'm not a Me Too girl. Yeah, right, right? Exactly. Well, he's, and he's a killer in Cold yeah, Blood, yeah. Uh, which is the Truman Capone. Yeah. It's just amazing anyway, that parallels. By the way, and I'm just fascinated, you know, because everybody appreciates a great lawyer when you need one, right? Right. Other than that, you know, people have their opinions, but yeah. you're needed at the most fragile times Correct. and the most important times in anybody's life. So what what's it like when, I don't know if you had an opinion about Robert Plague of whether he did it, but what, for a lawyer, what's the process when you're, you're talking to this person mm -hmm. and you're representing him, but mm -hmm. you kind of know he did it? I mean, look, a majority of people have done something. Uh, I don't know if it's what they're charged with. Uh, but then there are a lot of people where, you know, the prosecution gets it wrong. The, the, the law enforcement gets it wrong. Um, that's also common. Uh, I don't really care. I mean, I can tell, <laughs> you know, I've done it long enough mm -hmm. to where I know either they're lying to me or something doesn't add up. Uh, but to me, it's about the process, you know, are they screwing my guy over or are they following the law and following the rules and following the constitution? That's what I'm worried about is mm -hmm. that I, I'm sort of policing the overreaching. I don't really care whether they did it. And uh, you can probably sleep at night, though, but do you have- I you sleep just fine. You, so you had an opinion about the Blake thing? Of, um, I mean, maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's, how was that answer? Want to play poker? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, I, okay I have to, I, I'm not done with Alec Baldwin. I'm not done with this. You're I have not? to come back how, to one more thing. Don't we have other things to talk about? Yes, but you okay. guys have to convince me of something. Okay, yeah. this is the closing <laughs> arguments right now. And I want people's comments, If you're when you're watching this, give us some comments. How does Alec Baldwin sit there and say, I'm going to let the next 18 months of my life be in the hands of somebody else? They're going to be talking about him for a week to two weeks. He's not going to have the spotlight on him. He's not going to have a microphone where he can speak. That is not Alec Baldwin. I think he might run to the to the, to the window uh, the way, can and I swear say, himself in. Can I say something about that is not Alec Baldwin? I noticed his haircut yesterday. Alec Baldwin, for the last, I don't know how many years, I follow him on social media. He's got this disheveled, unkempt look, running around with a dirty T-shirt in the Hamptons, going, getting his coffee, whatever, with his seven kids or more. Um, and suddenly, of course, he's wearing a suit. He has to wear a suit. But, like, he's got this very polished, kind of like Cato's gelled out, like, you know, very perfectly. And I thought, yeah, that's what we do, right? Because we, that hair that he normally has is akin to the chaos on the rust set, mm -hmm. you know, he's coming in as this very proper Polished. looking guy. Um, that is also a big part of our job is to make sure our clients don't, you know, it's to create confusion as to how could this guy do that bad mm -hmm. thing? I, you know, I was wondering that too, is that Alec Baldwin, is this going to hurt his career or not? I mean, he's in, he's in Mission Impossibles all the time, which is probably the number one you know, franchise. A franchise is a billion dollar industry. Will crew still use him? And will this, has you, have it, has it hurt his career? Do we even know his agency? Does he well, drop? I, mean, I, you know, when you look I, at social media. He's 66, so he hasn't doing yeah, as many movies as he used to. But yeah. when you're looking but, at social media, there's a lot of sympathy for him. They're like, this poor guy should not be prosecuted. This was an accident. I mean, that seems to be the consensus mm. in the court of public opinion. So mm. let's see what, you know, what these jurors think. Yeah. yeah. Cato made a point that, Today that we're taping would have been O.J. Simpson's 70, Seven. 77th birthday. Mm. Right. Um, you know, we cover a lot of O.J. You know, right. you go back, you, you get every angle here. We've got the best coverage for the O.J. saga. You know, did, did, did that influence you at all growing yes. up as far as like wanting to be so a lawyer and what type of lawyer? It's funny you ask because I have a personal, uh, uh, you know, con not connection, but a thing about this story is that I lived not even two blocks from the crime scene um, on Bundy. And off of Bundy, actually. But this happened. Uh, Nicole lived on uh, Bundy and like, I think, 
Dorothy, between Dorothy and Darlington. And I was like on Mayfield and Bundy. And I was uh, in like the second year of college. I was at UCLA and um, they thought law enforcement thought, I don't know if you guys remember this day, they thought that OJ was hiding in, in the house, in the condo. He was in the, in the white Bronco. And eventually they you caught up the to the chase? Bronco. Yes. Yeah. But they thought that he was in there and they had the whole neighborhood blocked and I was cussing at OJ and everybody because I was trying to get to the airport. I was doing summer abroad for UCLA. And I'm like, what the hell? This stupid criminal. You know, why is he hiding in my neighborhood? Uh, you know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and by the time the trial started, and I wasn't even a lawyer. I didn't even think I'm going to go to law school at that time. <laughs> I was so fascinated. I, I watched the entire trial. I mean, it was, you know, it was like months and months, nine months or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, longer, a little bit longer. I yeah. definitely watched the, the, the critical most of this trial I watched. And um, I don't want to say it was why I went to law school, but, you know, I, I come from an immigrant family. And when you come from an immigrant family, you have two choices. You either go to medical school or law school. <laughs> So I was kind of like, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Cause I'm studying French literature. Can't really do anything with that. And oh, the OJ case <laughs> and just the phenomenal lawyering that went on in that case was really sort of what pushed me towards, uh, you know, a, a career in law. Um, so, you know, it really, it, it was part right. of my story to some extent. And of course, one of my best friends um, was the female on his team that Johnny Cochran picked out of the public Chapman? defender's office. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was interviewed many times by her. Yeah. And my, my, her daughter is my goddaughter. Well, Olivia. What's her first name? I forget. Her Olivia. Oh, Sean. Sean Chapman. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, she, Sean goes by, she goes by Holly. Yeah. yeah well, she goes by Holly, Holly now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and so then, you know, of course, Cochran was amazing. I still am friends with Barry Sheck. I met him fast forward years into being at National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I talk to him every time I have a DNA issue because he is the, you know, yeah. the expert lawyer on that issue. Um, we recently actually touched base on the Koberger case that we're going to talk about because uh, that has some DNA stuff that I was running by Barry. But anyway, um, wow. that team and then Shapiro, Shapiro just texted me last night because, you know, he sends cases to me. He doesn't really need to work, hasn't needed to work in a long right. time, but certainly now he's retired. Um but, you know, he, he refers cases to me and uh, so he was asking me about a case that he had referred. But anyway, uh, it's interesting because it's like I practice in the same town. So I have these connections and criminal defense bar is small, mm -hmm. even if we're spread out across the state. So that's why someone like Barry Sheck, you know, he's always accessible to me. We're part of the same network. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just because I, when you bring back the OJ stuff, I go back in my mind when you say Shapiro, which I liked Robert Shapiro. Yeah. But I'll never forget during the trial, he I'm testifying. There. When oh. he came up to me, you know, you walk in, in the morning and you still have that moment before it's televised or whatever. He said, hey, is there any way I can get an autograph for my son? He he just thinks you're the greatest. And I'll just never forget that. I was like, can I do, is it legal? Can I? Was it the son that committed suicide? I, or I the... think it was his name is Grant. Oh, Grant's I'm... dear. He's, yeah, he's his surviving son. Okay. So it was yeah. to Grant and uh -huh. I know once uh, did uh, uh, died in a drug overdose. Yes. Okay. And what was yeah. his name? Brent. Okay, Brent. So I yeah. think I signed it too. I'm pretty sure Grant, mm -hmm. but I'll never forget that. How Grant's surreal! A DJ now. How surreal God, that moment that's was. That's when you know you're a celebrity, that's, right? When I, the def the defense team's lead the charity is asking yeah. you for an autograph. Yeah. It's crazy, even surreal. Then Bob was uh, he kind of took the back seat. I mean, he yeah. was the guy that put together this team, um, but he wasn't really the one litigating the case. Yeah. And um, I mean, I give him all the credit for putting together. I mean, when you say dream team, that's what you think about, right? There's there's a lot of lawyers that have paired up over the years. You know, on Murdoch, my podcast partner um, paired up with Dick Car Uh What was the making the murderer? Um, I forget the name of the guy, um, the defendant. But there were two lawyers uh, that worked together. And it, it's common that lawyers come together, but n there's been no dream team like the OJ dream team. Yeah, probably never will be either, yeah. especially when you consider here in L.A. Yeah. A lot of them were already famous and then yeah. made more famous and, and the right. top of their game at right. the time. All right, you guys ready to move on? Yes. Okay, Idaho. Yeah, Koberger. Okay, so this trial isn't going to start till the summer of next year, mm -hmm. 2025. So there's a lot of time here. He's locked up. Man, for a lot of people, this thing looks like a, an open and shut case. You got one suspect. He's sitting in prison right now. He's a creep. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like he did it. The mm -hmm. media makes you think he did it. Mm -hmm. Um, the there's media. nobody else that's come out. You, 
I think, have a little bit different opinion mm-hmm. about this because, mm-hmm. Cato, do you believe it seems like, yeah, Koberger did it. Let's get this scumbag locked up forever I, as yeah, fast I do. as we can. I just want to know what the connections are with the other people. And one of the things that did bother me, well, I have Sarah take it over, but the, I always wondered why the person waited two hours to call 911. But I'm sure two, you have- uh, eight. Eight hours. Yeah. Okay, so that's obviously, I I, I hit a nerve with yeah. you but, of what that's all eight. about. Hours. Are you? But you're talking to us as an attorney right now, Correct. who would try to get somebody off, or like maybe just create a seat of doubt with the jury. Not that maybe somebody else did it, but maybe that they can't prove it. Is that what? Right. It's not my job or his public defender's job to go find out who did it. That's law enforcement's job. It's my job to uh, make sure that you got the right guy. I mean, he's so far from what I've seen. They don't have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. Now, the media, I fault 100 percent for convicting this guy. It's going to be very tough for him to get a fair jury anywhere, anywhere in the U.S., uh, let alone Moscow, Idaho. But, you know, look, what happened with this and this is now happening a lot is that he was identified through investigative genetic genealogy, what's called IgG or forensic genetic genealogy, FGG. Um, and essentially what they do is they they take a DNA profile different from the one that, you know, we all we've all known as DNA. And then they send it to the FBI for investigation. And then the FBI, they have a protocol. They get to go to certain databases, these databases where you go to find your uncle and your ancestry and all that, your father or whatever. Um, if you check off the box that, you know, they could use your sample for law enforcement purposes, which a lot of people do, then the FBI gets to uh, investigate and connect, you know, who the sample belongs to. That's how they got to Koberger. Now, the DNA, there was DNA found on a knife sheath near one of the bodies. That's what the media has just been going crazy about. Then he must have been there. No. You, Tom or Cato, you go to Erewhon you grab a you know bottle of green juice and you're like she doesn't know me obviously twenty five dollars <laughs> please twenty five dollars later food you get for less forty dollars later okay. that green you juice. go to food for less <laughs> and you grab a carton of milk and you get grab a carton of milk and you're like dang this is I thought it was gonna be ninety nine cents it's more I'm gonna put it back I then go in after and pick up the same thing. Guess what? Your touch DNA is on that carton. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. remember that this home was a party home. People from where Koberger went to college and where these students in this house went to college were constantly socializing, partying. There was a revolving door in this house. So Koberger could have very well at some point been in there, left the knife sheet there, or someone could have taken it from Koberger and it made its way there. doesn't mean Koberger himself was there with the body. So that's a problem, okay? Um, The IgG, finally, the defense was able to get materials turned over by the prosecution because it's so new. There's no Supreme court case that says that the prosecution needs to turn it over to the defense's discovery. So they were withholding it and the defense needs to know how the hell they came out with him being the person in the genetic genealogy investigation. They need to make sure that the fo- the protocol was properly followed. So all of that were issues. The other thing is he has an alibi. He says now everyone's making fun of it. I was moon gazing and stargazing. It's my habit to go on late night drives. Okay. I know it sounds weird, but, mm. but you know, the guy's weird. This doesn't mean he's a, he's a murderer. Okay. So here's the thing, the cell towers, and I can't tell you how inaccurate they are because I've had people who have been pinged 20 miles away from a crime scene and I was able to prove it. Okay. Mm. But nonetheless, the cell towers that were near this King's Road home, the crime scene, were not connecting to Koberger's phone. That could be because he turned it off like a good criminal or <laughs> or 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 the battery died or somehow it didn't pick up signal because mm. of malfunction. But they're making a big deal yeah. about he's a criminal. He turned off his phone. We don't know that he turned off his phone. In the same token, when you look at his alibi, Tom, where he says he was somewhere else driving, moon gazing or whatever, um, there are cell towers that apparently have some connection. So there's an expert mm-hmm. who's going to testify yeah. that he was there, mm-hmm. not there. Well done. Wow. Is Barry well sh- done, counselor. Well done. I feel yeah. like I'm on an episode of L.A. Law. That was good. Is Barry <laughs> sh- yeah, but, but here, I, I let amazed. me counter that with this. 
This is a unique case because A, he's got a great attorney, Ann Taylor, right? Yeah, she's she's, she's no, a great she's no public hack. defender. But B, this guy studied criminology. Mm -hmm. This was his passion. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd done studies and serve, you know, he had right. you know, focus groups and things. So unlike an OJ, for instance, that it's a crime of passion or whatever right. it is and something, hey, you're not thinking about it beforehand. I think he thought of all this stuff. I think he was a quote but if unquote, he good did, criminal. But if that's your theory, then why would he leave a knife sheath behind? Be well, accidents happen. You can't fix why everything. Why is there no biological matter? You slay, and, you slay four people and you get nothing, nothing. There's nothing. It's clean when the po police get there eight hours later. Clean. But it all goes back to my point. He thought about that, you know, beforehand. And, wow. and, and you're, you're saying, the clean the house. You're saying that know. when he is a student as a, for criminology, you're saying that he said, I'm going to see if I can get the perfect crime. Kind of. I, I, I thought that. But listen, too. there's oh. no footprint. It was snowing. There's no footprint there. There's one latent footprint, latent. And in so and there's no biological matter, no evidence of cleanup. It's unbelievable mm. that four people would be slayed in their sleep. There's gore and blood all over the, the walls. And then there's nothing when mm. the police show up. It's like immaculate. So I didn't know that. Yeah. Eight hours mm. later, eight this hours roommate called the police. And to me, look, there's a theory that she froze. You know, she just froze and she didn't know what to do. Eight hours. Come on. So uh, what's going to happen with that is, is have, uh, has anything been released with her as she, her, uh, you know, obviously the police interview, her interview. We have not seen it. Yes. I mean, I think okay. she's, they've gotten a statement from her, but everything is under a gag order. So mm -hmm. we don't know anything uh, until this goes to trial. But uh, there's a lot of problems in the case. Now, could these problems be addressed? Sure. But as far as we know right now, right. there's a lot of problems. Sure. There. And think about this. It's a death penalty case. So everyone's crying about how much tax dollars are being spent. I'm like, if you're going to kill a man, you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. it's it's costly to kill somebody right so you know and 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 a death penalty case it's a trial within a trial mm -hmm. and you know you need a death penalty lawyer in addition to ann taylor right you have to put together mitigation so it's a very serious case and i don't i don't i haven't seen enough okay right. based on what uh, we've of, seen opinions can change yeah. of course. you could go he's innocent then you start you know the case comes out you yeah, go oh my god i, I didn't know i, I that. gotta see a lot of things before my opinion changes well, when it's this <laughs> brutal and this yeah. violent and this horrific yeah. you want to find someone that it, did it is, right you right. want to point your finger at somebody and said he did it and they, it, they but that pressure yeah caused law enforcement to essentially just go straight to sure. Koberger in six it, weeks and so, so barry sheck's part of that too will he be part of the case no it's interesting i called barry to get an igg expert to explain igg to me um for our podcast because we we're covering Koberger on the podcast and he of course knew because you know he also he relies on igg to exonerate people mm -hmm. in the innocent project innocence project oh, yeah. Yeah. so uh igg has now become the it's the new thing in dna mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you bring up Barry Sheck because we talked about him on our episode yeah, last week. And, and you know what? And I'm just curious, has he ever communicated to you that you know, he did a great job, right? Yeah. He did his he job did during the OJ trial, right? He, he was brilliant. But he came across in a way that, you know, maybe a lot of people didn't care for. Mm -hmm. You know, did, does he have any regrets or is the bottom line only the job that got accomplished? Because, or was that his true personality? Because oh, you know, very condescending. Yeah, yeah, and they accused the police of planning blood yeah. twice. I'm not sure, you know, if they actually did or they didn't. Yeah. But I, I thought he was one of the guys in the trial that came across as kind of unlikable. And I don't know him. It's not that he's unlikable. <laughs> it's just he doesn't try to be likable. He's just got he's just kind of dry. You know, he's, he doesn't like to go on TV. He doesn't like to be in front of the camera. Um, he just is a just, you know, strict, yeah. you know, DNA workaholic. Exactly. You know? I, I, he comes across as... I'm I'm the best at this. Ask me your question, and right, that's right. It. And, then and, I, and I'm doing my job. Yeah. Nothing extracurricular, and he's not there to like be liked. But it's not because he's an a hole. You yeah, know, he's, he's just, just good. At what he's he actually does. he's just the very best. good at what he does. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand DNA, so it's easy to railroad people because you're so aggressive with your knowledge of it that you think he's being a bully. Yeah, but you or know, something. you also had Mark Furman. Never forget that 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 was a terrible part of mm. the DA's case mm. was Mark Furman, mm. you know, I mean, recently I, we're not talking about Karen Reed, but there was a modern day Mark Furman in the Karen Reed trial, which was Trooper Proctor, yeah. you know, um, you have a law enforcement, you have a lead detective who is biased, who's a bigot, who is, you know, um, just 
awful like Furman was, it's going to throw a wrench yeah. in your case. You know what's crazy is the OJ trial started months after the murders. Unbelievable. Right. I mean, a yeah. matter of months, the fall of 94, that trial yeah, was off and running. Quick. The Koberger trial isn't going to happen until what, almost three years after the murders? Almost. Yeah. That's a very long time. What, In your experience, what, what do the prosecutors, investigators, law enforcement do when there's that much downtime, like where they think they got their guy? Are they done looking for other suspects? They shouldn't be done. Secretly high-fiving each other. We got this because if it's not him... The real killer's out there, and who knows how many yeah. people he's killed right. since then. And that's an argument that we would make to a jury, is that they didn't do their job to um, essentially exclude all potential suspects. They just yeah. zoned, zoomed in on him. Um, and there's a difference, too. I mean, OJ was a different time. Um, there's advances made in DNA. Um, this Koberger case, there was a lot of discovery delays. The prosecution was not turning things over. There was motion after motion. There was a real fight for discovery. We didn't really have that in OJ. I think, you know, the DA pretty much, you know, I, I don't think they were shady. I just think they were shoddy, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, that, that has been, a, you know, a big difference that I see. And also we have IGG, which is new. And there, there was a whole other fight to get mm -hmm. those materials. So, you know, I think it's it's different in that sense, and that's why I say. And yeah. also, it's also a death penalty case. You can't bring a death penalty case to trial that quickly. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. It yeah. really is. You're going to have so much to talk about in your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'll come back. back here. Yeah, I would love. That. You know, being a great attorney is a skill, is a talent. You know, to be successful at the mm -hmm. highest levels. Could I give you ten minutes to prepare, and you could convince me, our audience, Cato, everybody, that Koberger did it? Like, could you? flip based on what they have and what you've seen that they may have and make a compelling argument that he's the only guy that could have done it. Stargazing, are you kidding me? Right, sure, stargazing, moongazing, his phone was not pinging to the towers. Uh, you know, there was a knife sheath with his DNA on it. The investigative genetic genealogy came back to him. Uh, there's no other person that would have been a closer match. Um, what else, um, you know? That he was described by this roommate that took out eight hours to call the police as having bushy eyebrows. I mean, right. how many Americans have bushy eyebrows? I, it's just crazy to me. hundred million? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Take you're, off you're, your glasses. Yeah. I think you have yeah. bushy eyebrows. With, I don't know. There's a reason I have them on. Yeah. With, your, with, your, with your point. So when you're, uh, Ann Taylor's the attorney for right. Kohlberger. So obviously they do mock, right? They do uh, someone yes. playing the prosecution. Someone's doing the, so the argument. So Tom's basically what you're saying is, I wonder what the argument is for the prosecution. Uh, what what Anne Ann is yeah. going to say, Anne is going to say, no, they have the answer to everything. You have right. to know the answer to every question. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, she knows, she knows what the prosecution's case is about and she's prepared to cast out. Remember, our job is not to go find the killer yeah. or, you know, obviously if we can point some fingers, it makes a stronger argument, but that's not our job. Yeah, our right. job is to say they don't have enough to say beyond a reasonable doubt that Koberger did sure. it. They certainly don't now. Can mm -hmm. that change? Absolutely. And it's largely because I, we don't know what they have. I'm just basing my opinion right. based on what I know they have, you right. know, which is out of a probable cause affidavit. Yeah. So you know? the lawyer's it, job is to just create a little shred of doubt, right? In one or two yes. of those juries, that's all it takes. And then members. they'll hang, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and he's just in jail waiting, correct? Yes. So he'll be there for two years and uh, Taylor uh, meets with him probably once a week. I, I mean, if that was my client, I would see him at least once yeah. a week. Yeah. yeah. You know, okay. I'm always fascinated to think where these high profile cases, Koberger doesn't have money. You know, this no. is going to be millions of dollars for a That's defense. That's why I said, if you kill a guy, you want to kill a guy on death row, you got to pay. Right. right. But where does he get the money? Uh, how how do attorneys in big cases like this really get paid? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm wondering if the dream well, the team county, even got the, the county pays Ann Taylor. Really? The, yeah. So the, state, has, the state, the state of Idaho pays Ann Taylor. So he has Sorry. the ability to go past the public defender, obviously get somebody really good. She is good. a public defender. She is? Holy. She is a public what? defender. I didn't she's know that. She's one of the few, because Idaho is a smaller state, I guess. So uh, she's one of the few death qualified public defenders in the state, which is why the case went to her. And um, she's damn good. I mean, this is where I always tell clients. If you think that just because you're public. paying a private lawyer, he's better than a public defender, that's a myth because there are a lot of dumpster fires mm -hmm. <laughs> that will take your money that don't know what to do or don't intend right. to do the right thing. And you could have not borrowed the money and, you know, qualified for the service of a public defender. At least it's an office right. and they have protocol. And I'm shocked. Yeah. No, she's amazing. Plus, she knows the inner workings of the county, the Correct. city, the yeah, key players, the, the prosecutors, the investigators. 
Yeah, Correct. that knowledge is invaluable. But wow, and of she's all relentless. the counties, right? Of all the counties, yeah. he ended up. Maybe he thought of that too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, that's a long time to wait. Do you think the fact that he's sitting in prison, you know, waiting without um, obviously another suspect, that says anything? Can you read between the lines on that? Sorry about this. What do you mean? I mean, what choice uh, does he have? No, he doesn't. But the fact that they have enough to hold him in prison. Right. I mean, you're saying oh, that there's not that much no, evidence. But, but, but that's the difference between probable cause and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Is there probable cause that he did it? Sure. There's ample probable cause in the affidavit that they filed initially where they went and arrested him. Well, but proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that requires it, way more. Well, it's going to be fascinating when stuff we find out more and more and more. Yes. And interviewing the criminology professor. Just just yes. it's going to be so much to this case. I, I seriously, it's going to be huge. Mm-hmm. I think much there is a with. genetic genealogist, uh, C.C. Moore, who came on my podcast, who I think is is so good. She's one of the first people in this field. Um, she's a great person to have um, a conversation with on the on the nitty gritty of sort of, mm-hmm. you know, how they identified him. Mm-hmm. Who does it favor okay. more when there's a big lull in time before the trial starts? Does it favor the in the, the prosecution where they can gather more evidence or does it just give her more time? It, it, well, a couple things. It depends on, you know, whether they're still investigating or covering their tracks or what they're doing. Um, but for the defense, there's a benefit in that there's less media coverage of this case. There's been so much said that is misinformation that poisons the right. jury in this case that I think giving that a, a, a beat is going to help the defense, hopefully. Um, you know, yeah. I, 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 maybe. Yeah. Any final well, words on Idaho, Cato? I just, uh, no, I'll tell you why. Because I want to talk Diddy. <laughs> Good segue. Mm-hmm. Great segue. And <laughs> man, you know, I have a couple ways of looking at this thing. The feds are taking their time right. because they're coming out with guns a blazing. Mm-hmm. And there's so much. They raided the houses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think once he's arrested, I think more people are, are going to be compelled to talk. Right. Because if you dig deep into Diddy's background, it is nasty. There's a lot of crazy stuff outside of the violence and the things that are, you know he's being sued for now. But wh- what's your instinctive gut telling you right now? I mean, he's out there well, approving pictures of him at Jackson Hole whitewater rafting, having a good time. Social, you know, that's on that's social just media. His, uh, that's just his PR. Uh, PR. Okay. Yeah. But it's bad um, PR. Well, yeah. I mean, but he's get. I mean, look, he also came out with that statement in response to the Cassie video, which was like crisis intervention. Uh, and so, you know, you they do what they do. I mean, yeah, it's bad PR. Mother's Day, he posted like not one, but tons of Mother's Day posts. Uh, for the moms of the kids he's had with different women. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like on the on the eve mm-hmm. of, you know, um, these sex trafficking allegations. And so to your point, his lawyers recently got a call in the last week from the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office, formally letting them know that Diddy is a target of sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. So what I expect you asked mm-hmm. is an indictment. And I say this because I've been saying this and, you know, I go on TV and everyone argues with me. Mark Garagos was arguing like he represented Diddy for a minute at some point for something. And he's like, oh, no, 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 it's all BS. I'm like, Mark, both of us go up against the feds in cases and we know how it works. And first of all, feds don't raid your homes when you're Diddy. And this is such a high profile case. They're not going to raid your homes if they've got nothing. So my belief is they had him on guns or drugs or something like that, but they didn't have him on sex trafficking and that they needed to get his devices to be able to make a make a case of the sex trafficking. But now they've informed his lawyers that he is, in fact, the target of sex. So an indictment is coming Mm -hmm. and those are man act charges. And if you read the recent lawsuit against him by a porn star, who claims she was sexually assaulted and, and you know, essentially um, was sexually trafficked. She literally draws a parallel between Diddy and Epstein and, and calls Diddy's like person who was arranging for flights and things like that as the Ghislaine Maxwell of Diddy. You have to have I mean, one. Well, book, every, yeah, yeah, every pimp has a, yeah. a you know, whatever, pander. Or but he's whatever. not booking flights. You know what I mean? He's so, not the yeah, one doing yeah. it. Exactly. So and I'm not saying that that lawsuit has legs. Whenever, you know, a celebrity has an issue like this, there are people who jump on the bandwagon who's, 
you know, obviously all the all the allegations have to be vetted individually to see who's you know who's sure. lying, who's telling the truth. But on the criminal side, he's going to have a problem. Do you think? Um, okay, so he has a uh, does he have a vodka line? Well, he'd Ciroc. It's is it gone? It's pretty much gone. A lot of things it's are gone. gone. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of gone. Do you think that um, one of his wife's or Look, this one cares about the branding. Okay, <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to have a drink. With you. <laughs> just wanted a cocktail with you guys. No, I actually, I, I said it because OJ was on the board of like twelve companies. They dropped him immediately, sure. so, yeah. even before any kind oh, of verdict. They disposed of him. Yeah, so he's he's been disposed. Do you think that one of the wife's or girlfriends? has like the sort of October surprise that she's got video or something that's going to like blow. Well, maybe Kim evil. Porter's dead, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, Kim well, Porter's dead and that's yeah. raising questions as to, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 just I am solely focused on sex trafficking. Look at what happened to R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. I mean, R. Mm -hmm. Kelly, the only difference is R. Kelly's victims were minors and their parents were complicit, in my opinion, for putting them in his custody because, the, you know, it was a ticket out of poverty, essentially. Right. But, but, but Diddy, you're, it's like the adult version. Most of these women are, I think all or most of them are are adults, they, they, you know, during the time that they say they were trafficked or assaulted. Um, but look how easily the government made a case of, that was the Eastern District of New York, made a case of sex trafficking and violations of Mann Act um, out of a uh, enterprise, like musicians, like the bands, like suddenly they became like the mob. Mm -hmm. They were charged with racketeering. Rico. Rico. Yeah. And so that's what that's, that's what Diddy's looking at yeah. here. Wow. Well, the feds never lose. I actually wrote a book yeah. where they did lose. They have a it high, never happens. high plea rate. Yeah. In most cases, plead out because they don't bring charges unless they have a strong case. It's 92 percent conviction. And then, oh, this is against, against normal people. If you're in the crosshairs of the federal government, yeah. it's over. Now, Diddy has unlimited funds, but they just hit you with more more felony charges until you have oh, to. Oh, they'll cave. bring everything in the kitchen sink. But, but there is. And I think people live in, in just tremendous fear of him. Yeah. You know, clearly uh, the people that have been victims of his in whatever capacity, and they're just going to come out of the woodwork as soon as he's arrested. Yeah. I think the floodgates open then. Right. Even though it's trickling now for with the lawsuits. For people to speak. Oh, yeah. 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 And I, I just, I hope they're waiting for the right moment and it just is the end of this guy forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think it's going to be, you think it's Well, those of us who've lived in LA end. too, I think we have a different perspective on Diddy because we've heard the stories over the years. You know, I, like I was, I train at a, at a gym not too far from where Cato lives and um, uh, a very well-known um, sound engineer who owns a huge studio out there in Studio City knows Diddy very well from being in a studio and he had stories. I mean, it's just like, it's the stories are everywhere. Everywhere. Y you'd end yeah. up at parties he'd be at and there's stories there. And I mean, none it, of them know. are good. Like I know a, a pretty big music executive, a big one yeah. who gave me Diddy stories about him not paying songwriters, promising that he would stealing yeah. the licensing from them, never seeing a penny. And then, yeah, you mentioned the West coast. I mean, Tupac, I mean, it's almost amazing that Diddy's alive, yeah. to be honest with you, the way things were in the and 90s you know, the, with the game. The, yeah, the, and that's, you hit, you hit the point I was just going to make, that the, the, the way that things were. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a culture, I had a case recently involving Chris Brown, and I went to his home. Um, it was a civil case against Allred's uh, firm. And I went to his home, we had an inspection, and, and I obviously learned a lot about where they hang out, the, 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 you know, the music studios, and then they do the after parties and then, you know, all that stuff. Mm, right. And obviously I've been to some of these things, you know, when I was partying, um, <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Next episode. <laughs> Next episode <laughs> or episodes. Wait, wait, uh, wait, Sarah. Were you slapped? <laughs> were you slapped? No. no. Okay. But, but, you know, there's, there is a culture and I'm not saying it's okay, but there's a culture of rap, guns, drugs, exactly. and chicks. OK. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's OK. I'm not. But you know what? When they want to look at the code and see if it's in violation of the code, yeah. it's suddenly a legal case. Yeah. And so it, we're in a time where things that may have been OK and cultural yeah. years ago are no longer OK. But he's so far above that. That's like saying dating young women's OK. Leo has been doing it for 30 years. But what Jeffrey Epstein was doing was horrific. Right. I, I think Diddy is on that level. I think I think some some things may come out eventually where. Yeah. Could By be. the way, Could if be. he's charged with a Rico charge, that worthless Cassie video that the DA's office couldn't do anything about because of the statute of limitations, that could be pulled in because Rico reaches decade after decade to the beginning of time. 
so long as the predicate acts are within mm-hmm. the statute of limitations. So that's what's dangerous about Rico is that I would not kiss that video goodbye yet. Mm-hmm. That video could matter in a Rico sure. charge. And maybe there's more videos. And there could be and, more and, videos. And they know that. They want to get a Rico charge to bring up everything. Oh, yeah. Convic- if, they, just- if, they, if Rico is a prosecution's wild card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We hate it. They love sure. it. Sure. Gives them a lot of leeway, right? Yeah. It, yeah. it reaches up and yeah. down and... You know, both directions. We got to wrap it up. This oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you one last thing. Did he have time to get his hard drives and a lot of a lot no, they of took data? All the, well, I, know, I don't know what's you, on it, but they took the things. Was his private jet went to? I can't remember where it was, but the, where you can't be extradited. Well, he would he wouldn't have known that. The, it's not like they give you notice when yeah. they're knocking on your door. So he wouldn't have known. Now, had he now, where did that video come from? That's my question. That Cassie video is horrendous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has to be the hotel. Well, well, no, but the hotel said the hotel changed management, and they said that we certainly didn't. The new management said we certainly didn't disclose the, the thing. There is allegations that he paid a security guard at the time to get the video. But if the video was in his custody, he certainly didn't take good care of it because yeah. it leaked. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know what his record keeping is like. Whether he keeps things, delete things, deletes things, but. They took a, a bunch of devices from the homes that they raided. Right. So it's a question of what what he had on there. Ne- next six months, he's indicted. Do you think? I, I think I think I think within the next six months okay. for sure. All right, this is, we'll leave it at that. Hey, it's great having you. Thank you. Sarah, it's great talking it's to you guys. Maybe we could get you to come back down the road. Yeah, of course. All right. Awesome. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> and then we'll do the party episodes. Oh, are you yeah. kidding? Yeah. yeah. Not getting out of that. She wants the vodka. But then, but then, but then I would need party episodes for I you just, two also. Hey, we'll dim the lights in here. That's we can talk a little bit about it. Don't worry. <laughs> I just realized we're actually getting my milk. It's half. It's at Half Foods. <laughs> I, can't, I can't afford it. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I'm going to say what I say every week. Make sure you uh, listen to this podcast as well. Go back and hear everything Sarah had to say. Go back into our our archive check out all the content at tom zander scandal kato kalen the episode we did with him right after oj died throughout the saga it's it's amazing stuff make sure you subscribe to the channel follow kato and his disgust of the milwaukee brewers on social media it's out there for everybody see to see day to day follow our community page on youtube we've got info on there we are going to be expanding to two episodes very very soon so we'll keep you updated on that so until next week for the one and only Kato Kalin. And for Sarah Azari, who was outstanding <laughs> and, today. And keep the hey. comments coming. Keep yeah, the comments coming. Yeah, I love yeah. reading, I love Sarah reading those comments. Sarah was awesome. Yeah, keep the was, comments coming. Sarah was amazing. And, and suggestions for I'm other also, guests. I, I engage, so I'll answer your questions. And the Presumption Podcast. Correct. Right? Check it out. At Azari Law, at the Presumption. Okay. Support Sarah. If you need a good lawyer, you know who to call. All right. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next week right here. One Degree of Scandalous. Hey, if you enjoyed that awesome episode today, I got two more for you to check out. Who were the biggest villain stars? What were the biggest lies and mystery of the OJ saga? We got that for you right here. And the OJ Simpson Bronco Chase, June 17th, 1994. Get the real story right here.